uh, so welcome everybody and thank you for the opportunity to present this work to you. Um, I've been really interested in um, cancer related fatigue for several years now. And so I'll just, I, I think I presented on it at this round last year, one of another project that I was doing, but I will give you a little refresher on that and then talk about some new data that uh, I've just collected looking at the impact of um, uh, cancer related fatigue on people's lives. So first of all, just to give you a little bit of background, um, uh, cancer related fatigue has been defined as a distressing, persistent, subjective sense of physical, emotional, and or cognitive tiredness related to cancer or uh, cancer treatment that is not proportional to recent, recent activity and interferes with usual functioning. And it's, um, it's different from the regular sort of fatigue or tiredness that we may feel and that patients often would say, um, even after like a, a sleep or something, they still feel it. It feels like a sort of a bone tiredness, um, something that is, just doesn't seem to go away. Um, it is described by patients as um, the most important and problematic and also the most distressing side effect that they experience. And um, it does cause great interference with people's daily life, although um, we don't know exactly what that means. So I, that's the purpose of the study, so I'll, I'll be able to describe a little bit more. Um, certainly during treatment, it's very common. Um, it's reported in over 70% of patients. Um, for most people, that uh, is an acute thing and um, it, it goes away once treatment's over. But there is a subset of patients who seem to experience fatigue uh, long after treatment has ended. Um, and the prevalence uh, um, estimate for fatigue in post-treatment survivors um, has ranged from 17 up to 66%. And the, there are many reasons for that uh, big range and their, you know, research and methodological issues. So issues around what measurement tools they used or what populations they've measured and how far out they are from their um, end of treatment. So I can show you a little bit of data from ours. Um, but I think right now it seems like the research really is consistently showing sort of about a quarter to a third of cancer survivors seem to be experiencing this fatigue. Um, uh, persist it's persisting after treatment for many years after treatment. Um, it does have a profound negative effect on people's overall quality of life. And, and in, I think largely it still remains unrecognized, although I think there's you know, lots of movement now to start thinking about ways that we should be screening for fatigue and how can we manage fatigue, but it still remains poorly managed. And a lot of times patients themselves don't report it to their healthcare providers, and um, we also know healthcare providers aren't necessarily screening for it. Um, the cause of cancer-related fatigue is pretty complex. It's multifactorial. Um, I think as a biopsychosocial um, model of fatigue probably explains it the best. There are many different um, complex um, and sort of um, accumulating reasons why people may have fatigue. We don't have one cause for cancer-related fatigue, especially post-treatment. So this was a study that I um, presented, I think, at this round last year. Um, it's a study that Doris Howell and I did uh, looking at the prevalence of cancer-related fatigue, and we looked in a large sample of colorectal breast and prostate cancer survivors. And what we found, uh, we used the uh, FACTF, which is a well-validated tool for fatigue. Um, and what we found was significant fatigue in about 40% of patients that have uh, breast cancer survivors, 33% um, in, in colorectal cancer survivors, a lower amount in the prostate site, so about 17% in the prostate site, although the men who were on ADT were up at about 30 to 40%, and then overall a 30% um, prevalence rate of cancer-related fatigue using a, a cutoff of less than 34 on the fact that. And when we looked across, so this was, um, this was a large sample of uh, about 1,400 patients. Um, and they were up to six years post-treatment. So then when we looked at the looked at them um, uh, in terms of how far out they were from their treatment, so the pink bar is the patients who are sort of much closer to the end of treatment within a year, uh, a year and a half of treatment ending. Um, the middle bar, the gray one, is patients who are a couple of years out of treatment. And then the blue bar is um, patients who are sort of five to six years post-treatment. And what you see here is really that fatigue doesn't seem to uh, decrease. What uh, you may expect that it would, but it seems to uh, be the same across these three time points. 
And the other thing we looked at at this study was um, we measured disability in these populations using the uh, WHO uh, disability assessment uh, schedule um, number two. And I, I think this is really quite a, a, a striking finding. Um, and what we found was um, in patients who were above cutoff on the fast desk, so who had significant fatigue symptoms, 91% um, of them also had um, moderate to significant levels of disability on the who desk uh, versus only 30% of those people who didn't have fatigue. So they're reporting very, very high levels of disability uh, to go along with the fatigue. Um, and I think that's really what spurred my, um, you know, curiosity around what is the what is the impact of fatigue on people's lives. We we don't really know very much about the experience of fatigue um, in cancer survivors, and um, I think it's important to think about that because fatigue sometimes for some people they sort of think fatigue. What does that mean? It's kind of a subjective experience, but. Um, if we can sort of quantify what it actually means in terms of the impact on people's lives, I think it, it can help to raise some awareness of how important a symptom it is. So that was what led to this study. And this is like, this actually is um, a study that was funded through ARC um, and was um, just a small study, really started out as a small study. It just wanted to do a cross-sectional survey, really trying to figure out um, the impact of fatigue on people's social functioning, their work status, including absenteeism and presenteeism, and then um, how, how it may affect their um, health service and social service utilization. Um, so as I said, the rationale really is that I think that this information is really helpful for us to further understand what the impact of fatigue is on people's lives. Um, the results um, can help to highlight the need for active screening procedures and interventions. And also, um, these, these outcomes might be relevant outcomes to measure in future intervention studies. So if we find that they are, um, you know, uh, very um, closely tied to fatigue or affected by fatigue, that um, they may be things that then when you're doing intervention studies, you'd want to see that those would improve too as, in, as fatigue improves. So the participants in this study, um, so actually uh, we, what I'm going to report on today is our breast uh, cohort, but I, we are actually collecting the data in colorectal as well. Um, so the, for the breast cohort, it, they were within one to five years of completing primary treatment. They could be on adjuvant hormone therapy um, for early stage breast cancer. Um, they could not have any evidence of recurrent or metastatic disease. They needed to be able to speak English to complete the questionnaires, and uh, they had to be adult. And as I said, the study design is pretty simple. It was just a cross-sectional study that we asked people to fill out when they were coming here for their follow-up appointments at Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Um, fatigue was measured again with our um, FACDAS, so the Functional Assessment of Cancer Therapy Fatigue, and we used the same cutoff of less than 34 on that to identify people with significant fatigue. Um, social functioning was um, measured with the Social Difficulties Inventory. Work performance was measured with the World Health Organization's Health and Work Performance Questionnaire, the HPQ. Uh, this allows us to measure absenteeism, presenteeism, as well as what their current work status is. And then we also measured uh, healthcare utilization and so social services um, uh, utilization. So that was with a health services utilization questionnaire that uh, Doris Howell has modified. So uh, we've been collecting the data over the past uh, year and a half. Um, we finished data collection um, just over the summer. In total, we uh, got 302 returned questionnaires with a response rate of 73%. Um, so that's, I think, um, what we typically find in our breast uh, samples here at Princess Margaret is around sort of a 75, 70 to 75% um, response rate, so it's uh, pretty good. Um, the women were... Um, you know, these demographics also are very characteristic of our study. So on average age of around uh, 56 years old, most were married, most had completed college, about half were born in Canada. Um, we had um, about 37% uh, that were above a $90,000 um, per annu an annual income. Um, most had received surgery and radiation and chemotherapy, so very complex treatments and about uh, two-thirds were still receiving hormone treatment. I have um, income and hormones uh, flagged there because um, to start with what we did was um, we took the FACTF uh, 
scores. We put people into groups of either fatigued or non-fatigued based on the cutoff. And the first thing we wanted to do was just to see if there was any differences in these two groups based on these demographic or clinical variables. And what we did find is that patients who uh, were more fatigued had lower income compared to those who were not fatigued. And also patients who were more fatigued were more likely to be on hormone therapy. So this is, uh, this is our fact cutoff here. So we had about 36% of the population who were um, scoring below the cutoff on the fact app, which would indicate that they have significant fatigue. It is quality of life measure, so lower scores mean lower quality of life. Um, and this, so this, this mirrors very closely the findings we found in our larger cohort study that Doris and I did. So about, you know, about roughly, you know, uh, 30 to 40 percent of these patients are experiencing very significant fatigue. Um, so the first thing we were looking at again is social difficulties, and this is with the social difficulties inventory. Um, social difficulties inventory uh, has three subscales: so everyday living, money matters, and self and others. Um, and then you can calculate a total score based on 16 of the items. Uh, so what we found here is uh, if you look at everyday living, um, we, uh, the people who were in the fatigue group, the score was uh, uh, around five compared to only one in the non-fatigue group. In money matters, it's uh, 4.2 uh, versus 1.2 in the non-fatigue. Uh, and then in self and others, again, 4.6 versus 1.7. And then the overall, total score was 14.2 versus 3.9. These are very, very significant differences. So what this is telling us is in all aspects of these patients' social functioning, um, the patients who were fatigued um, had much more difficulties um, socially. So in terms of managing their money, in terms of being able to interact with others, in terms of being able to um, uh, help support others as well. And the SDI also has a cutoff score of greater than 10, which would indicate um, uh, significant social difficulties. And what we found was that the patients who were fatigued, 57% of those met that cutoff on the SDI versus only 9.5 in the non-fatigue group. So we are seeing really significant social difficulties and interference with ability, the people's ability to, to function socially um, as a result of their fatigue. Um, the next thing we looked at was work status, and this is the WHO HPQ questionnaire. Um, so people are asked on this questionnaire what their current work status is. So um, there was no difference between the fatigue and non-fatigue group in terms of work status, um, if, whether they were working full-time, part-time, or uh, self-employed. About 56% of the fatigue group were uh, in working versus 66 in the non-fatigue group. But where we did find differences were in um, the rates of people who are unemployed or on leave. So 13% of the fatigue group were currently unemployed versus 4% in the non-fatigue group. And 22% of the fatigue group were still on leave, were on either short-term or long-term leave versus only 5% of the non-fatigue group. So, um, you know, it, I think it's interesting because some of these patients, uh, remember that these patients have to be one to five years post-treatment and that they're still on leave maybe up to three or four years or five years post-treatment is um, definitely indicating a problem that they're not able to get back to work. Um, okay, and then uh, this measure allows us to um, calculate something called absenteeism and something called presenteeism. So absenteeism really is just looking at how many hours a person of lost work um, so how many days of uh, work a person has missed or hours of work a person has missed, and you can calculate this for the past month. So what they're asked to do is estimate how many hours they've lost in the past week, and then you multiply that by four, or you can ask them how many hours they've, um, or days they've missed work in the past month and estimate from that. Um, so this calculation, absentee, uh, absolute absenteeism, is the number of hours, basically, that the, the patient has missed work in the past month. Um, and we used that, the estimate they gave us a four week, uh, one week estimate, and then we multiplied that by four. There are different approaches to calculating this. This is the way we've calculated it for this study right now. Um, so the fatigue group was um, reporting an average of 15 hours of missed work in the past month. 
Whereas the non-fatigue group, you see it's a negative score, which means they're, they're actually reporting that they worked more than they were expected to um, in the past month. So three hours on average more than they were supposed to. Um, that is not a significant difference, although, you know, there seems to be a trend towards that, but at this point it's not a significant difference. It's likely because the, um, as you can see, there's a high variability in the scores. We have very large standard deviations. Um, uh, the, the, this is an interesting measure. I'm happy to talk to people about it and share it, share it with people because we don't really have good measures of these things yet. Um, so I, I think it's an interesting measure. I think people struggle a little bit to fill it out. Um, but there's sort of these wide, very, very wide estimates and people have a hard time figuring out their hours of work and those kind of things. So uh, I think that that um, might be one of the reasons why we're seeing such huge variability. So the presenteeism is um, questions about when you're actually at work. So if you do go to work, um, how well you're functioning at work. So how, um, how much um, you're asked to rate sort of on a scale of zero to 10 you know, how well you're able to function. And so there's lots of questions where they're prompts. So how would you rate your coworkers and um, how would you rate yourself over the past two years on average? And then how would you rate yourself in the past month? And the way it's expressed is basically a percentage of the work not undertaken while they're at work. So what we saw here was that in the fatigue group, about 29%, uh, a score of about 29% versus in the non-fatigue work group, 17%, and this was a significant difference. And then the, the last question that's asked on this scale is for them to sort of um, rate whether they felt like they are functioning better, the same, or worse than their, compared to their coworkers who are doing a similar job. Um, so what we saw here is that um, um, in the non-fatigue group, 40% of, of the respondents are saying that they, they're, they're performing better than their coworkers versus only 18% in the non-fatigue group. And when you look at the worst, it's sort of the opposite numbers there. So in the fatigue group, 43% are saying that they're functioning worse than their coworkers um, and not as productive as their coworkers versus only 13% in the non-fatigue group. Okay, so the final measure that we used was um, looking at healthcare utilization. And basically, people are just asked if over the past month, um, there's a list of health professionals. Um, they can add health professionals that aren't on the list, uh, whether they visited them, and then how many visits they had, and estimate how many visits they had in the past month. And then there are also questions about like whether it was an urgent visit or a planned visit, those kind of things, which I'm not going to report here. So here what I'm doing is I'm just uh, reporting the number of visits in the past month that they've reported. So what we saw was um, in the fatigue group, they had an average of about four visits with a health uh, care provider, a health professional, that could be a doctor, a nurse, um, yeah, allied health, um, versus two in uh, the non-fatigue group. So they have uh, double the number of visits. Um, in terms of hospital visits, this would be um, ER visits, um, ambulance, transfers. Um, this does also include clinic visits. So again, we saw a significant difference. These are low numbers here. Um, in terms of psychosocial social support, the fatigue group had an average of about one, one to one and a half um, visits per, in the past month versus only half in the non-fatigue group, and that was a significant difference. And then we also asked questions around um, home and personal support, which a lot of these healthcare utilization questionnaires don't include, but I think it's important. So this is asking, you know, did you have, um, you know, a CCAC or did you have um, somebody come and help with groceries or meal preparation or those kind of things? So that really helping you at home to get, uh, to be able to function at home. We didn't find a difference in this. I, I thought maybe we would, but we didn't. This could be because um, these things rely on people to be able to pay for a lot of these services, and so it might be that we see that the fatigue group aren't working as much, they're also lower income, so, and that might be the result of the fact that they're not working as much, so there might be financial reasons why they're not getting as much help. Okay, and then this um, basically looks at um, whether or not they had a visit with any of these services over the past month. So under health professional, the first sort of columns um, to your left, um, this asks if they had had a visit, at two or more visits with a healthcare professional in the past month. 
So in the fatigue group, 73% um, had had two, at least two visits with a healthcare professional in the past month versus only 46 in the non-fatigue. And we looked at um, just doctor visits, physician visits, um, we separated those out separately. Um, we saw that it was 85 in the fatigue versus 68% in the non-fatigue. Um, don't forget that actually we are recruiting these people when they're coming for a doctor's appointment. So most of them, they should actually really all be about 100%. Um, uh, in terms of hospital visits or hospital services, it was 29 versus 15. Um, psychosocial, so 52% reported um, either accessing a psychosocial pro professional or a support group over the past month versus only 19 in the non-fatigued. And then home and personal support was 26 and 19. So the differences were in the psychosocial, the hospital, and the healthcare professional use, I guess. So um, that's all the data that I have for you today. And what I'm hoping is um, I'll just summarize it for you here, and then we can have some discussion around it, and I'm happy to answer questions. So first of all, I think what these results um, really highlight is that, um, first of all, cancer-related fatigue is um, uh, a, a significant symptom for a small, um, but I think, um, important minority of people, so about a third of can breast cancer survivors, a third to uh, 30 to 40 percent of breast cancer survivors are experiencing cancer-related fatigue up to five years post-treatment. And what we're seeing is that it really is exact exacting a very significant personal cost on their onto their lives. As well, when you look at the um, work status, um, I think you know I think we can say that it's likely. Um, uh, there's a, a cost to their employers, and when we look at healthcare utilization to our health systems as well. I think these findings really do highlight the urgent need to um, sort of ramp up our efforts around routine screening. Um, we do need to think about um, more efforts towards development of uh, effective in uh, interventions for cancer-related fatigue. I have a slide just after this to talk about that a little bit. Um, we don't have any gold standard, gold standard treatments for the um, gold standard approaches for the treatment of cancer-related fatigue, so I think we, we need to put more efforts towards that. I think future interventions for cancer-related fatigue should be assessing for these outcomes because we, we do see that they are directly um, related to cancer-related fatigue and um, could even directly um, address these issues. So addressing the issue of returning to work and how to manage fatigue and getting back to work and functioning at work. Um, helping to um, acknowledge the impact of their fatigue on their social functioning in ways that they can um, address that. So I just wanted to finish with um, uh, just a little bit of a review of what we know in terms of what existing interventions there are for cancer-related fatigue right now. Um, there have been a number of meta-analyses and, and systematic reviews that have come out over the past few years looking at what are effective interventions. Um, and the two things that have really come out are psychosocial interventions and exercise. So um, in terms of psychosocial interventions, they've been found to have a small to moderate effect on cancer-related fatigue, but uh, it's really difficult to make any really um, clear conclusions from these reviews and from these studies because it's not clear what specific components of these interventions are effective. Um, so they, they're fairly complex. They um, integrate numbers of different approaches. Um, when, they've, when they've done these meta-analyses or systematic reviews, they've sort of pooled them all together, but some of them use CBT, some of them use or psychosocial approach or psychoeducational um, approaches. So it's kind of hard to, to tease out what it is that's really effective there. Um, I think what's probably uh, clearer is the exercise uh, literature that's out there. Exercise interventions have um, a very clear um, effect on cancer-related fatigue with magnitudes that are a bit uh, larger than the psychosocial ones, um, still though in the small to moderate range. Um, there's reasons for that, and it's probably because a lot of these studies don't have criteria for enter, for um, sort of a cutoff for fatigue to go into these studies. So for the exercise studies, um, fatigue is often measured as a secondary outcome, but not the primary outcome. And so Patients don't necessarily have to have fatigue to go into those, so you wouldn't necessarily see such huge effects. Whereas if you did a study that focused um, uh, on fatigue as your primary outcome and screened and only included people with certain levels of fatigue, I think you would see the effects uh, to be larger. Um, exercise um, with aerobic and strength training components seem to be more effective in reducing cancer-related fatigue than aerobic exercise alone. Uh, and it seems like uh, studies where they've had uh, structured supervised exercise are more effective than home-based exercise. 
I think that, you know, the, the conclusions from these reviews are that there's a need for fuser, future research aimed at um, looking at how we can increase the effectiveness of these interventions, the effect size of them, um, as well as dissemination studies and knowledge translation studies to evaluate beneficial inter, uh, interventions in within our community. So how can we implement these types of interventions within community settings? Um, I think we also need to address motivational factors and barriers to implementation of exercise and psychosocial interventions, as well as adherence in these um, types of interventions. Um, you know, it's difficult to get people who are fatigued to exercise. It's difficult to get people who are fatigued to come to a psychosocial group intervention um, or a one-on-one -on -one intervention. So we have to look at um, what are the barriers for these patients and how can we increase their motivation um, how can we make sure that it's um, more effective, these interventions are effective for them? Just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to finish and then <laughs> I will open it up for questions uh, now. So thank you very much. I do want to acknowledge that again, that this was funded by the Canadian Center for Applied Research in Cancer Control. They gave um, a small uh, seed grant to me and um, I'm, I'm really happy and grateful because even some of these small grants that we can get from these organizations can, um, we can do quite a lot with them. And as you can see, this is a large database and I think some really important data.